there are eight different aspects of what we're gonna cover. And so in the book, every one of those has a chapter with poems and discussion about how um, a lot of things about these um, entries into poems. And so the whole idea basically is that um, I want to demystify poetry. I want people to realize that they have the skills, you have the skills to um, connect with poems. They're, so there's nothing technical um, in my approach here, but the really important element comes at the end. The unknowing poems can mystify you because you can study poetry for your whole life and really look at all the things that go into making a poem in ways that you can enter into a poem and you can still find plenty of poems that mystify you. So um, my goal in really acknowledging that is that a lot of people feel uncomfortable with poetry or they feel like some poems they just can't connect with. It makes them feel stupid or they think that the poem is failing. And I just want to kind of put in my support for allowing poems to mystify you. So I'm, I'm never gonna talk about what does it mean? I think that coming at it from some of these ways will, is they, these are the meaning and you will find the meaning as you um, let yourself explore a poem. Um, the first thing, and I wanna say too that, um, Thank you to the New Hampshire Humanities, which hosts a lot of really wonderful programs. And thank you to libraries like yours that host people to um, just explore a, a lot of different topics around us in the world. It's just great that you're here and that there's all this support for these things. Um, I would really like this to be a discussion. So I'm gonna blab a lot and talk about each of these um, entries but I want people to feel free to um, enter into a conversation about poems as we go through them. So you'll see there's, there's a bunch of poems here. Uh, we won't read them all. Um, so because I can't see you, I'm just kind of talking into, into the void here. Um, Susan may see if you raise your hand or indicate in some way that you have something to say, you can also feel free to put it in the chat. And, um, and Susan, if you see something in the chat, then um, that'd be great if you just um, let me know that and maybe read it. Sure. Um, I was gonna say that right now there's seven people attending. So if you wanted me to, Alice, I could just promote everybody so that they can all, um, you know, be seen if they want to and um, give them to op the option to unmute mute um, to ask a question if that's something you would prefer because yeah, it's that a small be group. If okay. You can do that. That'd be sure. great. And if, you, if people don't want to be seen, they yep. can at least have their, uh, their little box up. You know? Yeah. So I'm going to allow everybody to talk and then um, you should start out muted, but, um, and if you would remain muted and tell, or if you have a question, just to cut down on the background noise, that would be great. Um, great. And then if you want to be seen, you certainly can turn on your camera. I'm going to turn mine back off so you don't get distracted by my coworkers walking behind me and um, so on. So here we go. All right. Thank you. So the first thing I want to look at is this little quote by Carl Sandburg, which goes like this. It's right near the top of the page. Poetry is the synthesis of hyacinths and biscuits. It's such a clever sentence. And that was so Carl Sandburg. He was um, really playful. So, um, I'm curious about people's responses to this sentence and uh, what it says to them. 
we obviously know that it's not literally, poetry is not always literally about hyacinths and biscuits, but people have interesting responses to this sentence. And if anybody's um, willing or interested in typing out or saying what comes to your mind when looking at that, that'd be great. Uh, to me, it just says, you know, hyacinths and biscuits. It's just the the basic need of food and then the beauty of nature. So it's kind of a nice um, combination. Yeah, definitely. There's, you know, biscuits are so plain and simple and fundamental. Bread and hyacinths, not only are they flowers in nature, but they're pretty showy and strong, uh, strongly scented. So, you know, they're extravagant. Um, and can, so, you see, can you see the chat, Alice, at all? No, I don't know why. I, uh, okay, I, then I will, I, I chatted that um, for me, the hyacinth sort of represents beauty and the biscuits are comfort that, mm -hmm. um, I think that poetry can do that, uh, both make us think of beauty, but also we can find comfort as well as other emotions. But that's what popped into my head. Yeah, that's nice. That's very nice. Um, I did finally get the chat up. Um, so now I can see that comfort and beauty. Um, there's lots of different ways you can interpret it. And these are really good um, foundational ones. I also want to point out just what it sounds like. If you didn't even know what these words meant, this poetry is the synthesis of hyacinths and biscuits. There's a lot of um, th, s, i. There's all these sounds repeated. Like he could have picked different flowers or different a different food, but he picked ones that kind of all um, meld with is and synthesis and with each other. So in some ways, part of the synthesis of combining things is just through the sounds of language itself. And we're going to come back to that. So um, let's look at these eight things. Shape. Poems look different on the page. I mean, you know, when you see a poem, it's not a recipe. It's not uh, the, the basketball stats, it's not um, an essay. It tends to look different on the page. And, and these days, poems can be all over the page in really unusual ways. They usually line up on the left side and not on the right, but not always. So the shape of a poem might already give us some um, reaction. I'm not going to have you read these just like, you know, stanzas, one big section. Um, this one has lines that go way out there. And then some of them are really short. So there's kind of like a flow back and forth. This one, meditation on a grapefruit, kind of spreads around. Mm -hmm. um, it's not all lined up on one side. This one has couplets. This one's one of mine. So, you know, you already kind of have a little relationship with, with a poem like, uh, as you encounter it just by the shape of it. Number two is words. This is a pretty obvious one, and, I, and I'm kind of doing this on purpose because I want you to know that you these are all things that you know. Poems are made up of words. So if you read a poem and you're just not sure what's going on or how to encounter it, you can really just pay attention to some of the words. Any words that stand out, any words that echo each other, words that seem to contradict each other, or surprising. And think about everything that is in a poem is there for the effect of it. 
And that's true in all writing. We're trying to have an effect. What is that effect? What, what effect is it having on you? And the words are a lot of that. Sound, poems make sounds out of the words separate from what the words say, which is what I was playing with, with Carl Sandburg's sentence there. Sometimes the sounds are harsh or soft, um, lullaby-like or more crisp. And, you know, words are made up of sounds. So those are very primal and we have reactions to them. Images, poems can make you see things that aren't there. And in writing, imagery is not just what we see in our minds. It's all of our senses, which is why teachers are always telling students to use their senses when they're writing something. So imagery might be that you get a smell or you get um, a sound. These things, you know, come through in the poem. Number five is emotions. Poems can make you feel things. And so there's layers of emotion. There's what's happening to you as you read it what happened to you today or this month that is putting you in a certain state or mood that's making you primed to see something in a poem like you know sometimes i'll work with people and they'll say this poem is sad and i'll say is the poem sad or are you sad is the poem making you feel sad or did you bring sadness to the poem and what do you think was the author's feeling in writing the poem or wanting to get through so there's all those uh, points of emotion. And the same with thought. Poems can make you think. Some poems really seem to center around an idea. Um, they may be trying to make you think about something, but you can definitely just say, what is this making me think? Number seven is probably my most um, sort of analytical or literary kind of thing, literary devices. Poems use some of the same ploys as prose. So when you sit down and you're reading something, if you're a reader and you're starting a new book, you're gonna start feeling what's the mood here? Are there people? Is there a setting? Is there a situation? Is there a conflict? And these, these are the same kinds of things that poets might do, but they just have a really, really short amount of time to get through any of the things that they're setting up for you to experience. And then finally, unknowing poems can mystify you. And I personally am really grateful for that. I feel like there's so much sense and logic in our lives that I love having the opportunity to just say, whoa, wait, what? <laughs> and, and really have that experience of some of the, the kinds of things that happen to us on the earth in this life. Things that we can't always explain. There's books and books about love, books and books about religion. And yet there's something that's mystifying about those experiences too, and many others. So thank goodness we have poems to echo some of that. Anybody have any thoughts or comments before we actually look at a poem about any of that? I will look in the chat and see if anybody writes anything. All right, I'm not seeing anything. So, um, but if I see something pop up, I will come back to it. Let's start with this four line poem from Robert Graves from a while back, but not far, far back called Love Without Hope. Don't forget the titles. Titles are really important. So I'll read it out loud and, we'll, and then just, I'm gonna give you time to just read it for yourself again. Love without hope, as when the young bird catcher swept off his tall hat to the squire's own daughter, 
So let the imprisoned larks escape and fly, singing about her head as she rode by. So when you read a poem, just let it wash through you. Don't worry about what's going on, but just take in the information, the lines. You might want to kind of circle back. Okay, now that I get this line, I might want to go back to this line but just try to get an image in your head. So I'm gonna give you a moment to read it again to yourself. And if anybody wants to write anything in the chat or speak, Please feel free to do that. The first thing that I picture is there's this young man who is the bird catcher and he's putting his, the birds that he catches in his hat. Yeah. That's what Sandy just said. Birds as prisoners in his hat. They're imprisoned, imprisoned larks. They're probably something that he's going to sell to people who like to have songbirds in cages. And so that, and that's his um, employment. So then what does he do? He sweeps off his hat in greeting like being a real gentleman to, you know, bow and sweep off his hat, which lets the imprisoned larks escape and fly away and sing about her head <laughs> as she rode by. Why is this poem called Love Without Hope? What kind of a mood does or what kind of feeling comes through when you if you put yourself in that young bird catcher's shoes and you do that what does that feel like can you hear me yes um right now i can okay and uh, to me it seems like love without hope uh, uh, you don't know that she's passing by into the last line. He's, he's being gentlemanly, but she's not going to stick around very long. And I, I, I think there's love without hope because there's really no hope at this point of him being able to connect with her. Um, and yet his heart may be a flutter. He may be attracted to her and certainly the larks are full of excitement for being let go as well. Um, <laughs> so there, there's a certain amount of happiness here, but also the realization that um, nothing may come of it except the freedom of the larks and the fact that she's going to go on her way. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, just that those last words that she just she just rides on by. Um, so Susan said, maybe he's embarrassed by the birds escaping when he was trying to be suave <laughs> by doffing his hat. And, um, but he, he let it happen. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm gonna say your name right. My Letta says to me, the larks are his thoughts because they come, they come from his head. He lets them go. She probably knows what he's thinking, you know, that he did this. She probably does know what he's thinking, that he um, really likes her or is interested in her. Um, and so he just let his whole day's work just fly off. <laughs> that's, that's some kind of dedication. And so even if he is embarrassed or even if he has forfeited all that work, um, we come back to love without hope. So the title could be 
love as a noun. This is about love that has no hope. Or it could be a verb. It could be you should love without, even if there's no hope. And the same thing in the first line, love without hope. What is it telling us then? If it, it you know, is this an instruction? Even in the, in the third line, when it says, so let the imprisoned larks escape and fly, that could be the result of him sweeping off his tall hat. He swept off his tall hat, and so he let the imprisoned larks escape and fly. Or it could be, you, we should love without hope. We should let the imprisoned larks escape and fly. Our thoughts, our caring, our the beauty that we have to offer. Yeah, I, I, I don't find this negative. I find it uplifting but because I, I do think that he's at least allowed to show his feelings um, by doffing the hat. Um, and he may not be able to connect with the girl, but the, but the larks do go free and he is able to um, manifest what he's feeling. So, yeah, um, it's um, unless you're a completely practical person, it is inspiring to think that he did that. And that maybe we should be more open to doing that kind of thing. It's a, a really simple poem, but it definitely, um, if we look at those words up above, um, we, we see that it was a four line poem. The lines get shorter and shorter. There's rhyming. We talked about the word choices, whether that word love is a noun or a verb. The imprisonment swept off his hat. Um, the rhymes and the rhythms of the lines are the sounds. We see an image of what's going on and the image gives us a feeling, gives us feelings and thoughts. Um, all of that is set up literarily. And yet, you know, so much can happen in four lines that, you know, we could write a whole treatise about and never really completely nail down. That's the unknowing part of it. When I read poems, I'm looking for any of these aspects to excite me, any of these eight aspects. When I write a poem, you know, my, my wildest dream would to have all eight of those things be there in the poem to take um, people with them. That's, you know, that's not gonna happen all the time. If any of them are there, um, that's wonderful when we read poems. But it is sometimes really exciting to find poems that do all these things. So I wanna read a longer one that um, we'll, you know, we'll have to sit and think about a little bit, but you'll, you'll respond as we go too. First thing just to look at is the shape of it. It's made up of separate stanzas and and there are five lines in almost all of the stanzas, but there's one stanza that has four lines and one that has six. So he could have divided it up into even fives, but he didn't. And my reaction to that is, hmm, what does that make me feel when I see that, that difference in the, the lines there? What's going on with that? And so we'll, you know, we'll react to that as we go through. You'll also see just basic stuff like um, sentences. There are, I believe, three sentences maybe in this poem. One of them is the first two stanzas. One of them is the second two. One of them is the third two or the last two. So that's just, that's just kind of, okay, what's he doing with the shape of it? Benevolence by Tony Hoagland. 
When my father dies and comes back as a dog, I already know what his favorite sound will be. The soft, almost inaudible gasp as the rubber lips of the refrigerator door unstick, followed by that arctic exhalation of cold air. Then the cracking of the ice cube tray above the sink and the quiet ching the cubes make when dropped into a glass. Unable to pronounce the name of his favorite drink or to express his preference for single malt, he will utter one sharp bark and point the wet black arrow of his nose imperatively up at the bottle on the shelf. Then seat himself before me, trembling, expectant, water pouring down the long pink dangle of his tongue as the memory of pleasure from his former life shakes him like a tail. What I'll remember as I tower over him, holding a dripping whiskey flavored cube above his open mouth, relishing the power rushing through my veins the way it rushed through his. What I'll remember as I stand there is the hundred clever tricks I taught myself to please him, and for how long I mistakenly believed that it was love he held concealed in his closed hand. So um, take a couple minutes to read it again to yourself and just try to picture it and feel it as you go. And please feel free to write anything in the chat or speak if you have something you want to say about this poem and your reaction to it. It's a really powerful poem that you feel the relationship between him and his father and the longing left over from when he was a child and wanted to please his father. Yeah, yeah. And the benevolence, the title, I think is, you know, his feelings of wanting, but I mean, at the end where there's still the closed hand and the lack of love, but the title benevolence mm -hmm. seems to want to contradict that in his, in, in his benevolence towards his father. Yeah, it's a little mysterious, that mm. title. And is it, because we don't know whether this, whether he will give the dog what he wants. Right. So maybe the benevolence is the possibility of forgiveness, right. but we don't know how that's going to come out because really the end of the poem leaves us pretty devastated and um, leaves us in the, in that loss in the dark. In in the dark. Deep and sorrow. Yeah. The darkness of it. Yeah. Um, um, 
And as, as Sandy says in the chat, a lot of the poem is amusing. Uh, when my father come, dies and comes back as a dog, we don't really know what the tone of that is yet. Then we just, we get a lot of these sounds, the gasp of the rubber lips and the, the door on sticks followed by the Arctic exhalation of cold air, the cracking of the cubes. I mean, it's just so, it's almost um, harsh, really. Um, so that starts to make me feel like, ooh, something is not good here. <laughs> something, something is not right. But he keeps coming back to these doggy images. You know, he will utter one sharp bark. And even the rhythm of that line is, um, is like a bark. It's sharp. Um, and the wet black arrow of his nose the, at the end of the, uh, so the next one has the long pink dangle of his tongue and shakes him like a tail. All of these doggy things. Um, Somebody said the, the father's imperious. Um, since the dog version of the father is also imperious. Yeah, the, that dog is like, give me what I want, right? And yet now in this fantasy of my father dying, coming back as a dog, it's the speaker who has the power. Um, so Chuck has written the hundred tricks for approval or love make me wonder if he plans to see what the dog would do to earn the treat. Like, is he going to make that dog do tricks to earn what he wants the way, the way that he had to do tricks to please his father? The last two stanzas which are one sentence altogether. Um, I find them really suspenseful. Like they almost kind of imitate the holding of that dripping cube and whether the speaker is gonna give it to the dog or not. Like we're waiting to find out. The whole, those two stanzas, we don't get, like normally in a sentence like, the subject and the verb are kind of important and the verb kind of settles us into what's going on here, but we don't get to a verb till the seventh line. There's all these like subclause, subclause, subclause. When, uh, so it goes, what I'll remember as I tower over him, holding a dripping whiskey flavored cube above his open mouth. We keep waiting for like, what, what I'll remember is what? relishing the power rushing through my veins, the way it rushed through his, what I'll remember as I stand there, we're just waiting and waiting, what's gonna happen? And then we get to is the hundred clever tricks I taught myself to please him. So I feel like we're sort of hanging there just like the dog is, just like that speaker has felt like he has been. What about what he's got concealed in his closed hand? How long I mistakenly believed that it was love he had concealed in his closed hand. Somebody uh, mentioned the fist. What did he do with that fist? Sandy said, I feel like the fist was a weapon not filled with love. Maybe there was violence. Maybe there was um, a physical abuse. But what he's got in his closed hand right now is that dripping whiskey flavored cube. And if you think about that, you know what? If you hold that in your hand long enough, there's gonna be nothing there. It's just gonna melt. There's nothing there. You could say that this poem is kind of based around an idea, the idea of the father coming back as a dog and, and acting out as a dog what the speaker has felt that he has acted out. 
Um, but there's certainly a lot of emotion in here and it comes out through the choice of words and the imagery around the dog. Um, yeah, so Susan mentioned all that repetition of the phrase, what I'll remember. And Sandy said, could the closed fist in life be the hand surrounding a drink glass? That, you know, that's another closed hand. It's all about what's, you know, what's in that drink. Or is the closed hand just symbolic of the love that he withheld from his son? And now yeah. the son has the same power to hold back that love from the dog. So it's a question of whether he will give the benevolence or not. Right, right. And we could probably talk all night about whether what our opinions are about whether he should or shouldn't, or you know what, um, what you know what we think about that because we're each going to come to this with different experiences or different feelings about the situation and how it should be resolved. Um, but it's not resolved really; it's left hanging there. That's that's a. Uh, Pretty intense, as somebody else said in the chat. Is there anything else or should we move on to another one? Okay. Um, I'm gonna come down to this one. How can black people write about flowers at a time like this? This is a pretty recent poem responding to um, the cause of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so I'll read it and then again, um, let you read it again to yourselves. How can Black people write about flowers at a time like this? Dear reader, with our heels digging into the good, mud at a swamp's edge, you might tell me something about the dandelion and how it is not a flower itself, but a plant made up of several small flowers at its crown. And Lord knows I have been called by what I look like more than I have been called by what I actually am. And I wish to return the favor for the purpose of this exercise, which too, is an attempt at fashioning something pretty out of seeds refusing to make anything worthwhile of their burial. Size me up and skip whatever semantics arrive to the tongue first. Say, that boy, he looked like a hollowed out grandfather clock. He looked like a million dollar God with a two cent heaven. Like all it takes is one kiss and before morning, you could scatter his whole mind across a field. There's definitely a lot packed into this poem. And, you know, we could spend time looking at the words chosen. Why is it a swamp's edge? Um, why is it a dandelion? Why are the seeds refusing to make anything worthwhile of their burial? Semantics is an interesting word there. Hollowed out grandfather clock. 
million dollar god and then this kiss and then the phrase and image of scattering his whole mind across a field so yeah there's definitely a lot and I'm hoping that you will, you know, you have this packet. I'm hoping you'll spend time and read the other poems and read these more and keep processing. But let's see if we can just say a few things about, about this poem and um, what it's addressing. And certainly the title is helpful. It starts off almost just kind of informative, like, okay, they're at a swamp's edge. They're in the mud. That means you're kind of, you're at the edge of something and it's messy, but it also could produce plants. And how the dandelion is not a flower, but it's made of many flowers at its crown. All of that seems tame enough until then we get to something personal. Lord knows I've been called by what I look like more than I've been called by what I actually am. And so, and that's like the dandelion. We don't see it as what it is. We see it as one flower. Um, Susan asked when it was written and could it be about the previous administration? Um, it was written just a few years ago. And um, I think it's responding to a lot of the killings of black people. I mean, the image of the hollowed out grandfather clock is so strong. If, if you are, a, I would imagine if you are a black man in this country with all of the killings that have gone on, there is that emptiness. And it's, to me, that's such a, a strong image because once you hollow out the grandfather clock, it's not working the way mm -hmm. it should. Right. You could almost, you know, kind of imagine the word strike. It doesn't strike yeah. anymore. And, um, and grandfather, you know, like the heritage, the, you know, the generations. Because he stops the line after grandfather. He looked like a hollowed out grandfather. That's, that's what we see. And, you know, line breaks, which is like a, one of my favorite topics to talk about when we talk about the shapes of poems and how they affect us. You can do a lot with the line break because the line breaks where, so what's left is a line. And the line is a unit of information in a poem, even more important than sentences. So if we, because for a moment there, we see him looking like a hollowed out grandfather until we get to the next line and hear that it's a grandfather clock. And so now it has multiple meanings because for a moment we heard the grandfather and now we hear the grandfather clock. Mm -hmm. And that all happens because he chose to end that line right on that word where it kind of hangs out there with some more um, depth. The next line, you know, stopping before the word heaven is also interesting because you don't expect the word heaven. That's pretty surprising right there. Million dollar God with a two cent heaven. You could think about that too. What does that mean? That there's, um, the heaven is kind of cheap. Is that a good thing? doesn't cost much to get in, or does that mean that it's not, uh, it's not really worth much? And I wondered whether it talked about, 
excessive jewelry, you know, do you deck yourself out and you're still stuck with a two cent heaven? Because if, if you're a hollowed out grandfather clock, if you're killed or if you're, if you, no matter how good you look, you're, you're not going to, well, I guess you are going to heaven. But to me, a two cent heaven sounds like it's not a very good heaven. Mm -hmm. The last line is the one that really um, doesn't number on me. Because if you keep thinking about the dandelion and how we, when the dandelion is what we call a clock, right? The, some people call the puff head a clock. Um, when you blow that, not the yellow flowers, but the puffed up remainders, it scatters the seeds. But in that last line, they're scattering a whole mind, which is like having your brains blown out. Yeah. So when you go back to the title, um, I think he's, he's using flowers to talk about something much more um, human. That, you know, plenty of poets talk about nature to shed light on our humanity and our experience. This has taken it to a whole other level. Mm. see we have well our hour is going by kind of fast i'm just going to actually say a little bit about some of these poems and you know you can come back to them yourself um the e.e e. cummings poem is pretty um well known and it's well known that he writes with a lot of strangeness um there's tons of rhythm and rhyme that kind of hold the poems together. And if you examine these lines, there is some, um, there's a lot of thought in them about why he chooses what he does and how he um, goes back and forth between uh, different kinds of comparisons, more thicker, more thinner, more seldom, more frequent. Um, so there, there's definitely some sense to it. It's not total nonsense. Um, definitely worth thinking about. Um, dusting is really interesting because it is literally about, about dusting, about, you know, wiping all this stuff away. And her language in here, her word choices are, are really interesting. Pearl necklace viruses, protozoans, submicroscopic little living things. Um, you know, it, she's talking about how dust just keeps on coming. You're going to keep doing this action and you're going to keep having dust. But somehow she ends up making this a thank you. I mean, she starts off, thank you for dust. It almost becomes, um, she uses the word eternal. She almost turns it into a spiritual thing. Meditation on a grapefruit is a really, um, just a wonderful exercise to pick an object and write about it and um, really show what it feels like to um, indulge in something meaningful and pleasurable, but so simple as eating a grapefruit. Um, I, I'm going to read you mine at the end, just because often people ask me to do that. But So this one, Monet refuses the operation. 
just a gorgeous poem about how Monet's um, eyesight was changing. And if you're familiar with his paintings, they're, they become very impressionistic and um, he paints the water lilies and the water itself. And the colors are very muted and overlapping. And so this is kind of a, he's talking to the doctor. Doctor, you say there are no halos around the streetlights in Paris. And the doctor has obviously been telling him, I can fix this. I can do some, an operation on you and um, make your eyesight clear again. And Monet is saying, no way. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want that. How can you not want to see what I'm seeing? It's beautiful. So I'll, uh, I'll read this one, Driftwood, talk about it for a minute. Driftwood. When they arrive at the frozen shoreline, smooth and white from a sea that carves and carries them to me, for all I know, they are not trees and they don't come from a forest. I may as well have never heard of a forest or any other place than here in the world. I stand on the beach and receive these great boughs are like seals born and shaped by the waves, the way snow is livened by wind. And I don't deduce distances or depths, only know now there will be a fire and what drifts, arriving like the sound of a voice saying my name. I came here to listen, and I listen and collect, and wood washes in remembering nothing of fences, nothing of nails, and can hold the cold for a while at bay. If I light it, this driftwood burns well, and it has no reason not to. I will tell you that the first title for this poem when I started out with it was Acceptance. And if I tell you that, you might read the poem a little differently. Um, but I decided to make it a little less, um, less didactic, I guess, in the title by just letting it be about the driftwood. I find it interesting that you say that it, um, in the last line, this driftwood burns well and has no reason not to. What's interesting about that? I'm, I'm trying to think of what, what I pictured. I mean, I, I guess even though driftwood can come ashore from water, it very often is very dry um, mm -hmm. and will burn well, but Mm -hmm. I feel like there's more to it than just it's a good source of heat. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there's definitely, you know, driftwood comes from somewhere, but I think I was kind of imagining if you're standing on a shore somewhere and there's no trees there mm -hmm. and driftwood washes up, where is it coming from? But like, imagine if you were like somebody who had never left where you, you know, like somebody thousands of years ago on this shore who never had been anywhere else. There were, they wouldn't know what a forest was. This stuff just washes up and it gives them something. Mm. And there's always things that we can receive and not necessarily question what the source of, of that gift was, just receive it. Mm -hmm. um, so we could take a few minutes um, since our time is sort of up, but we could take a few minutes if anybody would like to just to make any comments about the poems that we did read or the experience of 
thinking about poems in terms of these entries, what are the images, what are the sounds, the shape, the word choices. I mean, I'm hoping that you'll um, just give yourself an opportunity. I don't know anything about you, so I don't know if you're all poetry readers already or wanted to try to learn a little bit more so you could be more comfortable with it. Um, but these are just ways to, ways to let a poem come in closer to you and for you to uh, connect with them. So I'd be happy to hear or read any of your comments or thoughts where you might take it from here. Well, I enjoy reading poetry and I'm a, I'm a retired uh, middle school language arts teacher um, mm -hmm. and science teacher as well. But um, it, I, I love the eight points that you bring up in your book and it just, I continue to read poetry, but it also struck me that when I was teaching, depending upon what child um, or what person was reading a poem, one or more of these would appeal to someone more than to another person. So it, it's, I, I admire what you said about wanting all eight in a poem, but I think that there are some wonderful poems where um, maybe the sound is what you're really paying attention to. And um, mm -hmm. totally, yeah, just absolutely, really like a poem that just really plays with one of these things can be awesome. And, um, and I think it's really great for teachers to say, you're not going to all connect with the same poems all, you know, in agreement. And, and that is totally fine. And I really like, no, knowing and being able to say there is no one meaning to this poem. You, you just shouldn't approach a poem feeling like you have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I think it can, can appeal to you for many different reasons. So I thank you for this evening. This was fun. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you all. Um, and please feel free to write me any thoughts that you have later on. It's my my name is my email, alicebfogel at hotmail.com. I'm always interested in people's responses. Is there anything else? Um, oh, I do want to remind people, as Susan said in the beginning, that, um, that there are some evaluations to fill out and the Humanities Council gets a lot of their funding by having people do that. So we would really appreciate you um, taking a moment to do that. Anything else, Susan? Uh, I can't think of anything, but I really enjoyed it, Alice. Thank you so much. Just well, hearing you read the poems was really lovely, too. <laughs> well, thanks for hosting me, and thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I hope you have a lovely evening.